smile? Can he speak with enthusiasm? And he was talking about his daughter, that uh, he was taken to his little girl, a puppy, I think it was his mother, his mother-in-law's dog that had babies. And uh, he was picking up the little dog to take to his daughter. And he was so full of love and enthusiasm to anticipate his little girl's joy at seeing that puppy. And when I saw this man, that this man can like animals, I thought he was, I mean, I wouldn't insult animals by saying that he was an animal, but this man like animals. and. Does he love his... He has a little girl. Can he have little girls? Does he love a little girl? And then I saw that light aspect of him, his capability of uh, getting enthusiastic, of loving his child just as any human parent, of loving a dog just as I would love my dog. That was a horrifying experience for me because that meant also one thing. If a man was like me, if a man could love like me, if he had also love and some light inside him, then his darkness, his horror, that must surely mean that they also exist in me. That the darkness and the ugliness and the fear that I have experienced, it was not only outside of me, but it was also, I was participant because I was human. And if this man was human, he was also like me. So therefore we were well, with different inclinations. Well, I had never in my life have felt any type of inclinations like the ones he had, uh, that somehow we are all made of the same cloth. And that some characteristics maybe come to light in a human being by circumstances, by makeup, or whatever, and some others don't. But somehow we are all made of the same fabric. All that was what led me when I was put in my cell again, that I went into that deep confusion about that and led to my surrender to the dark aspect of God. And this surrendering to the darkness, to that, that dark aspect of God, to his dark face, to me, while there are no words that can truly describe it, I could say that maybe it's like diving into a very dark pool that is more like a in a funnel shape where the walls are totally smooth and once you dive into it you can never come out from the same place that you enter you have to go totally through the darkness subterraneanly and then perhaps without any guarantees come out on the other side and uh, in the incarnation of Christ when he says father why hast thou forsaken me there was that surrendering and entering, it seems to me, into this dark pool. And furthermore, right before dying, in spite of all that darkness, he still says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Still this trust in the brightness of God, in the coming out of the other side, which reminds me of Job also saying, in the midst of all things and in the midst of all the bragging that God, uh, in which he responded to Job, and Job says to him, I know that my vindicator lives. I know that my redeemer lives. But also, I like the idea of how we see the Holy Sophia, that the Holy Sophia enter even deeper into darkness, that feminine principle. Not only she enter into darkness by suffering and being overtaken by the powers of the, of, of the density of the archons, but she forgot totally who she was. She lost her way, she lost her vision, and she lost her sight. Which, in this manner, Sophia is more like us. We are Sophia also. We have lost our way. It's as if we have come to Earth, uh, uh, supposed to get somewhere, but uh, somebody forgot to give, to give us a map. So we have somehow to find, uh, find our own saga. And Sophia goes and loses her sight and go totally into darkness to the point that she needs to be rescued. But in her traveling through the darkness, she has left a trail for us. And then when she comes, uh, when she comes out and uh, she recovers her vision, she has left landmarks for us. She has left a trail that where we can enter the darkness and we will not be spared, but we also can come out on the other side. And for me, my experience was very much that way, jumping into that very, very dark pool where there was no hope, there was no um, guarantees 
that there will be another side, but it's just totally interesting that even if it is the dark side of God, still this is what is, and there is nothing else I could do. And then the other side opened. When Orthodox Christians claim that evil and suffering in the world is the result of human fault, and I think that is almost, for many people, whether they're religious or not, this is almost a kind of assumption. You know how often people who suffer some kind of disaster will ask, why did this happen to me? Or why did this happen to that person? As if there were a why, as if there were someone to blame, as if it had to be someone's fault. Um, when in fact it might be what you would call an act of God, meaning a catastrophe which is not in human control. But this, this almost reflexive attempt to find human fault somewhere in suffering, uh, I think is, is a mistake and a terrible waste of energy and an increase of suffering when people are already suffering enough. And therefore, I, th I think that the, the Gnostic and Jewish mystical points of view, which involve the conviction that suffering is just built into the nature of the universe. It's part of the, the weaving of the very structure of our, the fabric of our lives, is, is a much more sane and grounded and um, perception. So suffering, in your view, is, is not a result of sin? There certainly are forms of suffering that are the result of sin. When you're talking about deliberate inflicted violence, um, deliberate you know, harm inflicted by some people on others, yes, there is a great deal of suffering in the world that is the result of what you could call sin. But there's, there is much else that people suffer, for example, death itself which I, I cannot imagine is the result of human sin. What do you mean by sin, if you use the word this way? I'm using it in the conventional sense, that uh, the result of some moral fault. Um, that, well, yes, obviously there, there, are, there are forms of suffering when someone is murdered, for example, that are the result of, of the fault and decision and malice of other human beings torture and various forms of, of human violence directed at other people. But there is much in the world, I'm thinking of forms of illness, which are not caused by anyone. To look at that as if it comes on people by their own fault, as, as everyone knows, turns the victim into someone who obscurely deserved it in some sense, and, and increases thereby the suffering, I think, adds to necessary suffering, unnecessary and brutal suffering. Very often I have been asked the question, how do you handle, as a Gnostic bishop, as a bishop, the question of sin? How do you tell people how to deal with it? My answer is always, first of all, what is sin? I don't like the word because the word denotes an offense against God. And uh, in my opinion, we can't really offend God. The offenses that we com commit are against one another. And these offenses, they are, as I see them, out of blindness and ignorance. If we really were to be aware of one another, to be sensitive to one another, not to be so separate, set against one another with such boundaries. We would not be committing so many cruelties and atrocities, or any at all. If you really were to know yourself, you really could not harm another, because in looking at another, you're looking also at yourself. I think and this is where I go along with the Gnostics, that the real sin is ignorance. That we don't know 
who we are and what we are and what our limitations are. And so we somehow feel that we shouldn't do wrong, that we shouldn't, uh, that we should follow this authority outside of ourselves. We don't take responsibility for knowing ourselves and our limitations and seeing ourselves in, in some kind of proportion to the, the whole cosmos, the whole world, the nation, the group we're in, the relationship between man and woman. We're seeing ourselves as a part of the whole and yet um, carrying that wholeness within us. It's a paradox. But that's the real sin, that one-sidedness, that egocentric uh, way of looking at life as though we are the center and God should somehow pay attention to us, do what we ask. I mean, it's ridiculous, but yet it's a, it's a very childish thing in a way, and it's it's carried from our childhood, carried from our training, carried from the authorities that set up religious institutions and say, this is the way you must behave. Well, it is essential into our world to reintegrate the feminine principle in our, psych in the, our psyches, in both males and females. One thing that we must not lose sight of is that spirituality has no gender. Nowadays, I hear a lot of uh, a phrase that I find somewhat repugnant, which is female spirituality. To me, this is separating even more, creating a greater adversarial position between men and women. Spirituality is spirituality. The feminine principle comes to both of us if we care to discover it within ourselves, whether we are male and female. There is no gender in that. But the reintegration of the feminine principle is absolutely essential. For while it is very important to achieve a social and political equality among men and women, this is not just that alone is not going to solve the problems that our world faces today. Our ecological problems, our political problems, wars, that are not going just to be solved by this equality that, as I said before, is essential, but perhaps by reintegrating that feminine principle which in Gnostic literature we call the structure of life, the essence of wisdom, within our psyches is where we can think things a little better, uh, become a little bit more aware of our oneness with all. But it's not by separating ourselves, by creating two different cultures opposed to one another of males and females, but it is by working together, realizing that one without the other is incomplete. Zo leidt het denken over tegenstellingen ook tot vragen over mannelijk en vrouwelijk. Uit de alchemie en de gnosis wist Jung dat de vereniging van de tegendelen van mannelijk en vrouwelijk essentieel is. In de apocalyps ziet hij die gedachte bevestigd. Evenals het klassieke individuatieproces eindigt de apocalyps met het symbool van het mystieke huwelijk. Maria is nu als bruid met de zoon en als Sofia met de godheid in het hemelsbruidsvertrek verenigd. Met de erkenning van deze waarheid heeft de paus, zeer tot verbazing van alle rationalisten, in 1950 de ten hemelopneming van Maria afgekondigd. Dit dogma is in onze tijd in elk opzicht op zijn plaats. The question of whether Mary can play the role of a mother goddess is an interesting one because today we hear a great deal about goddesses. It seems that the uh, women today are identifying with the goddess. 
We hear a lot about women who are actually finding the goddess in themselves, and um, it's an interesting phenomenon because the goddess, and particularly Mary, if we consider her the goddess, has a quality of perfection about her. She, uh, she bears a child free of sin, free of sexuality. She is virgin after birth. So she's not a real woman, is she? She's, um, she is a goddess. I have to say that makes me a little suspicious of her. I find it difficult to identify with her. I uh, like the Gnostic goddess better because Sophia does sin. Sophia falls to earth, Sophia, uh, forgets the masculine principle. She separates herself from the Godhead. And uh, coming to Earth, she's overcome by the Archon. She's defiled. She's blinded. She goes through ignorance. She goes through uh, uh, suffering. She goes through repentance. She uh, recognizes her wrong. She becomes enlightened. She goes through the experience of redemption. Mary has none of this. So she, to me, represents the woman who, by being foolish, becomes wise. I think it was William Blake who said, if a man could succeed in his folly, he would become wise. And this, I think, could be said of the Sophia figure. The Virgin Mary was giving this particular dignity because she had carried the son of a god within her being, she a mortal woman. And what we need is to remember the old wisdom, the old Sophia, Chokma, or Shekinah, that feminine principle that on her own she stands as a divine entity, not as a mother of a divine child, of a holy man, but as a female spiritual power all on her own, equal to the masculine spiritual power all on his own, as co-creators, as uh, uh, co-protectors and saviors of humanity, not just of humanity, but of all creatures in the universe. Now that's completely different from Mary, the, the handmaiden of the Lord, who is chosen to be the instrument through which Jesus is born. Uh, she has no divine status at all, except for that which is much later attributed to her in a far more limited way. It seems to me that had this element of divine wisdom been acknowledged in Jewish and Christian tradition more explicitly, and I'm not speaking here about men and women, because then we could get into a discussion of how men are different from women, and we hardly can even evaluate that in a society which has been set up the ways that our, ours has. But rather, if we talked about the, the, the sort of principle of spiritual wisdom as manifested in all people, men and women, um, you might see a very different structure of authority in Jewish and Christian institutions, for example, if it were acknowledged that every person had within himself or herself the capacity for spiritual wisdom. It would be hard to use the image, which is totally pervasive in Christian cultures, of the shepherd of the flock and the sheep, that is, in English, it's the pastor. Uh, the, the, the pope is presumed to be the, the shepherd, and the, the congregation is seen as a, as a herd of animals which need a human guide to supervise and to, and to direct. And, I mean, what, of course, nobody takes this image literally, but what it suggests is that, that these people have no capacity on their own to make spiritual judgments. I think this is wrong. <laughs> and, and it also leads to a highly authoritarian attitude in many of the churches, in most of the churches uh, with which I'm familiar. In order to respect one another, in order to have a relationship, one has to be equal. It's very difficult to have a relationship between master and slave. It's very difficult to have a relationship between somebody that owes its uh, own, uh, own estate 
to another person. But by finding this equality in the two principles, perhaps we can get beyond patriarchy, beyond matriarchy, beyond feminism, beyond male chauvinism, and arrive to a point where the two opposites can intersect each other, again as another cross, and meet at the center, an androgyny which is not, uh, in which is not implied an amalgamation or a confusion of what they are, or an androgyny in which each power is uh, vibrant and can cooperate with each other to form a harmonious whole. In my own analytic practice, time and again people say, this is what I've been taught, this is what I've always believed, but is it right for me? So people do seek it out, but not very many. Uh, with our media pressure today, uh, all over the world, uh, we are told what we're meant to hear. We know that there's much that we're not told. And uh, it's easier not to question. It's easier to be amused. Our society likes to be amused, likes to be entertained. They don't like to be pricked with the uh, uneasy questions for which there are no answers. Alle goden zijn één, zei Jung, en Gods schaduw is overal. Ook in Shiva, de godheid die door de Hindoes wordt vereerd. Zijn serene schoonheid is bedriegelijk, want hij is ook drager van het vuur dat vernietigt. Dat vuur woedt ook in Yahweh, de god die volgens Jung mens werd om zich als mensenzoon van zijn schaduw bewust te worden. Zo is het lijden van Jezus van Nazareth het dramatisch antwoord op dat van Job. En het staat symbool voor het lijden van de mens van alle tijden. Job's drie vrienden zochten troost in vrome woorden. Maar wat zouden Job's drie vriendinnen tegen hem zeggen? I think I would say nothing. I think that people try far too much to find the right words. I know when I was going through certain losses, people I saw people struggle to come up with the right word, as if it would change anything. And I wanted to say to them, there's nothing to say, you know. There's absolutely nothing to say, except I'm here and I care about you. That's all you can say. So if I were one of Job's friends, and I expect to be many times again, um, I think the only thing one can do is to offer an embrace, to be willing to cry with someone, to be li willing to listen to that person's anger and rage and confusion and grief. To sit through that is one of the hardest things to do. It's much harder than coming up with some platitude. Uh, to bring a hot meal, um, some simple gesture, and to be able to be present and not turn away from such a person, that is far more important than saying a word. I think if I would have been there at those times and uh, have been with Job, I would have told him, uh, count your blessings now because things can get much worse yet. We need to say, what are you doing to me? Why are you doing this? This is not in the way of chiding God or saying you should not do it. But it's in the way of trying to understand what is the lesson in this? What can I learn from this? And in a sense, I think this can be a very general uh, way of looking at life that when something happens to us, good or bad, uh, desirable or undesirable, that we ask ourselves, instead of rejoicing or despairing, that we ask ourselves, how is this experience able to enlighten me and to bring me further into the realm of consciousness? That that's what individuation is. That seeking, seeking, always seeking, and knowing that we're on a path and we never quite get there, but we enlarge our consciousness with every step we take. Zelfs de verlichte mens blijft onbekend met degeen die in hem woont en wiens gestalte geen kenbare grenzen heeft en hem aan alle kanten omvat. Diep als de grondvesten van de aarde en wijd als de hemel.
Dit boek, De Verborgen Dimensie in het werk van Jung en Pauli, bevat de voornaamste punten die in de vier afleveringen van de serie aan de orde zijn gekomen. Het zijn interviews en begeleidende commentaren. U kunt het boek bestellen door 2450 over te maken op Giro 606000 ten name van Icon Hilversum onder vermelding van Boek Jung. Het boek is ook